Well, I have to say it's really exciting to be here um, in Watertown. And, uh, and um, thank you so much to the um, South Dakota Soil Health Coalition for inviting me here. It's a really, really inspiring. Um, the work that you're doing is really amazing. And um, I do get to travel a fair bit, see a lot of different parts of the world. And um, I have to say that what you're doing here really is, is first class. So I'm very honoured to be here and to be part of it. Um, also to hear that the presentations that have gone uh, prior to mine, uh, there's one advantage of being one of the last speakers in that is that you get to have the last say. Um, but the disadvantage is that everybody else has already said it. Uh, so <laughs> I have been uh, trying to put together a few things that I hope will challenge some thinking and uh, present a little bit of new material. Um, which, you know, in the soil health sphere, it's really, it's, it's as those of you who are on the journey, which is just about everybody in this room, uh, it is really exciting. There's new things being discovered almost every day. It's a universe, really, that we know very little about. Um, people have said that we know more about, you know, the solar system and, and the stars and, um, than we do know about, about the soil, and that's very true but it's something that is changing very rapidly. We are learning a lot about soil and how soil functions. And it's, um, as those of you who have a passion for soil health know, um, it's a really exciting journey to be on. So, uh, um, and the other issue is if I stand here, I've actually, I'm right in front of it. So I, I either, would it be better if I stood over, over here? Is that good? Does that work for everybody? Okay. So let's go. So one of the things that I want to, wanted to say, this uh, saying actually comes from South Africa, it's not mine, but is that if you haven't uh, discarded a firmly held belief in the last 12 months, check your pulse. You may be dead. Um, we are rapidly discarding a lot of things that we thought we knew, uh, not only about human health, um, but also about uh, animals and also about the soil. So, you know, the, the frontiers in ruminant nutrition, for example, human nutrition and uh, plant nutrition are definitely expanding very quickly. And some of us, including myself, have had to uh, go, okay, so what we thought, you know, was how things work is actually not, not how it is. And one of the things that is really changing the way we're looking at the world is the technology that we now have to look a little more closely at things that in the past we were not able to see, like microbes. And uh, we've, we've realised that really it is the things we cannot see that are running this place. And the sooner that we come to terms with that and realise how powerful these microscopic little beings are, then the faster we will make advances in where we need to go because um, these little critters that we can't see are very useful for helping us achieve our goals. So a recent census of life, don't ask me how they actually measured this, um, but they worked out, scientists and scientists worked out that there are 550 gigatons of carbon-based life forms on planet Earth. And 450 of those gigatons are actually in the form of plants, which is hardly surprising because when you do look around, uh, you see that almost everywhere in the world that you go, there are green plants, whether that be ground cover plants or uh, shrubs or trees, that the major life form on Earth is actually um, plants. So that wasn't really a surprise. What I found surprising was that of the other 100 gigatons, so we have 550 gigatons, we take away the 450 gigatons of plants, and what we find is, is of the other 100 gigatons, 93% of that is actually living things in the form that we cannot see. In other words, microscopic living things make up 93% of the other 100 gigatons. And those microscopic living things are the protists and the bacteria and the archaea and the fungi uh, that basically run our soils, run our bodies, uh, run animal bodies. They're very, very important for ruminant nutrition as well. Um, run our plants and we need to figure out a lot more about how they work so that we can uh, help with all of those ecosystems and as 
any of you in the room who've had um, health challenges or know people that have had health challenges or read about human health, you'll find that almost everything you pick up today will talk about the gut microbiome and how important the microbes in your gut are for, uh, for you because they, they run you. So you have to look after them if you want to be healthy. So the same thing goes for soil. We have to understand how the microbes in our soil work and look after them if we want our soil to be healthy because they comprise you know, the major biomass on Earth apart from plants. So if we have a look at the weight of microbes in that 93%, we see um, this is just a, just a diagrammatic representation of which forms of microbes there are making that up. So the protists are there at the top in the orange, the archaea in the purple, fungi green, and bacteria in the beige colour at the bottom. So bacteria make up a massive 70% of that um, of that 100 gigatons. Uh, at one time, you know, we used to think bacteria were bad because we associate, you know, they're germs. And I still see, you know, the um, hand wash that says, you know, kills 100% of all germs or kills 100% of all bacteria. And I think, my goodness, you know, we we are so ignorant about the fact that really 99. Point 9% of them are beneficial and we need to have them. We don't want to be killing them all. Um, and then we, you know, now that people have understood how important bacteria are, some people still think fungi are bad because we think of fungal diseases, but in fact 99.9% .9 of them are not only beneficial but essential. Um, and the same, of course, goes for archaea and protists. And what, uh, what I haven't talked about and what I don't have time to talk about today are the viruses, which are a magnitude of order uh, an order of magnitude, sorry, even more abundant than any of these other life forms. Um, they're not considered to be living things because a virus is just a fragment of RNA or DNA, so it actually doesn't count in this graph. But in, um, in reality, those fragments of RNA and DNA are very, very powerful, as any of you who've ever had the flu will know. Um, and viruses, in fact, are um, key determinants of the functioning of all these other microbes and larger things like animals and people. So the things that we can see, the insects, the fish, the birds, um, the, the earthworms and everything that people have been talking about over the last few days, you know, the wildlife, our, our livestock and of course people, we make up the remaining, the things we can see, make up the remaining 7% of life on Earth. And humans are only a tiny part of that. We actually constitute 0.01% of the biomass of life on Earth. And we consider ourselves to be so incredibly powerful. Um, we have made major changes on this planet, most of them not good. We now understand why those things are not good and we are going about changing them, uh, reversing many of the effects that we've had, which is fantastic and we're using our intelligence to do that. Um, but we need a lot more than human intelligence in order to do that. We have to, uh, if we're smart, we will engage the help of microbes to, uh, to assist us in making those changes um, to, lot to, to life on Earth. So there's not many of us in terms of weight, um, but we do have some intelligence and hopefully we can use that to, to good ends. Um, so that figure that I've given you there of humans comprising 0.01% of the biomass of life on Earth, that's by weight. I'm not talking about numbers there. When we talk about numbers, we find that the differences are even more staggering. So one teaspoon of healthy soil, those of you who are already familiar with this, particularly if you take it from near the roots of living plants, it will have more microbes in it than there are humans on Earth. And if we take a more biologically uh, abundant environment than that, say the rumen of a, of a cow or a sheep, uh, one drop of, of rumen fluid contains 10,000 times more microbes than there are humans on the planet. So think about that. One drop, one tiny drop of rumen fluid contains 10,000 times more microbes than there are humans on the planet. So it's really hard to get our head around, you know, these uh, differences in scales between uh, the human population and the population of other living things. And even within our own bodies, we have around about one trillion human cells 
and 10 trillion bacterial cells. So on a cell count, we are only 10% human. And I think there is a book written by that, using that as a title. And then if we look at our genes, you know, the genetic material that codes for basically everything that we do and think, uh, we have around 300,000 human genes and about 100 times more that in bacterial genes because of the huge numbers of bacteria that we have in us and on us. Um, in effect, we're only 1% human if we look at it from a genetic point of view. And the situation in plants is exactly the same. If you look at the number of cells, living cells that there are in a plant that are actually plant, and then you look at all the microbes that are on plants and in plants, and around plant roots, you find that plant cells are outnumbered by um, microbial cells. So again, we look at a plant and we think what we're dealing with is a plant and plant genetics, but actually what we're dealing with is the microbes on, in and around that plant. And that's the way that we have to change our thinking. As I said at the beginning, if you haven't discarded you know, a, com a deeply held belief in the last 12 months, you know, check your pulse because you have to start thinking about microbes on you, on your animals, in you, in your animals, and on and in your plants. That's where the future is, thinking about that and how to manage those. So all plants and animals are embedded in a microbial world. We can't see it, but it's there. And we have a microbial world embedded within us. This is actually a good thing because microbes are capable of performing all sorts of amazing tasks that we humans, even though we think we're clever, are not able to perform. And how do they do that? Um, when we start looking at them, we realise, you know, it's, it's a tiny little thing, you can't see it. it can't, they can't hear, they can't speak, they can't uh, see anything. I mean, just close your eyes for a minute and think, okay, I'm a tiny, tiny, tiny little microscopic thing and I can't see, can't hear, can't talk to anybody. But there's millions and millions and billions and billions of, of us microbes all out there and we have to coordinate our behaviour in order to do the miraculous things that microbes do. So how are we going to do that? We can't use any of the things that more so-called advanced forms of life like humans can. Um, mind you, with all the advanced communication skills that we so-called, we apparently have, sometimes we don't do a great job of communicating, do we? Um, one of the talks that we heard yesterday, Andrea was saying, you know that we need to talk to each other more and communicate more and um, tell other humans, you know, about what we're thinking and what we're feeling. But microbes are very, very good at doing this. So how do they communicate with each other and how do they coordinate their activities to do the sorts of things that they do? Well, they use a process called quorum sensing. How does quorum sensing work? Well, we also use that term in human society. If we have an organisation like, um, let's say, the Soil Health Coalition, how many members do you have, Sarah? 537. Sorry? 537. Ah, okay, well, let me... Go back, go back and change that question then. How many people are on the board? Nine, nine people on the board. So if you, nine directors on the board. So if you were going to have a board meeting about something, like uh, we're going to invite this crazy lady from Australia to come and you know, <laughs> speak at our event and tell us we need to know more about microbes, and you had a meeting about that and only one person came to that meeting, you probably wouldn't actually be able to make that decision to say we're, we're going to spend you know, money on airfares and whatever to, to get that lady to come here. So you would probably have a minimum number of people in, on the board that would be a quorum? Do you, it's six, is it? Five, five. Okay, so five members of that coalition would need to be present at that meeting in order for a decision to be made. If one person turns up at the meeting, the coalition cannot make a decision about something. So there is a soil health coalition that is able to make decisions, but they cannot make that decision unless they have a quorum of five members come, five directors come to the meeting. So those of you who belong to any kind of a group or an association, you'll, you'll understand how a quorum works. Well, it's exactly the same in the microbial world. For example, we have bacteria, lactobacillus, in our uh, large intestine that are able to manufacture B vitamins, like vitamin B12, for example. 
perfectly capable of doing that. But how many people, probably people in this room, are vitamin B12 deficient? Some people go and have to have injections for vitamin B12 or take supplements for vitamin B12 or supplements for other B vitamins. I mean, really, if you had enough lactobacillus in your large intestine to reach a quorum, they would collectively then make a decision to manufacture B vitamins. But they will not be able to make that decision or switch on, what they're doing is actually switching on their genes to manufacture B vitamins. Or, or vitamin B12 to give you a specific example. There will be a specific species of lactobacillus that will be able to manufacture vitamin B12, but in order to switch on the genes to do that, they will have to reach a quorum. And what do they need in order to reach a quorum? Well, there has to be a certain number of them. So it's a population thing. So what, what sorts of things would prevent you from having lots of lactobacillus in your gut? Well, taking antibiotics, eating meat that was produced in a confined feeding animal operation where the animals were fed antibiotics will have exactly the same effect as taking antibiotics yourself. Uh, consuming any, any other kind of chemical that's going to affect microbes in your gut, which is most of our food has some kind of chemical either added to it when it's growing or when it's in storage or when it's being processed. There's an awful lot of chemicals get added just in the food processing uh, business. And if you look at the ingredients, for example, you know, in bread or any of the common things that people consume, there'll be what used to be in bread, like, you know, flour and uh, yeast and salt and those kinds of things that used to be in bread. And then there'll probably be 20 other ingredients like flavor enhancers and emulsifiers and preservatives and heaven only knows what that didn't used to be in bread 50 years ago. And have a look on the packets, have a look at the, on the packets of snack foods and see the list of ingredients that's actually there. Those things affect your gut microbiome. Those things mean that you will not have sufficient numbers of microbes in your gut to manufacture the vitamins that you need. Now you walk into a supermarket and you'll find one whole aisle will be full of supplements that people are taking all these things to try and replace what microbes in their gut should do. That's a very well known example in, the, in uh, the human health sphere. So if we look at the parallels in soil, we see exactly the same thing. We are meant to have lots and lots of microbes in our soil performing all kinds of uh, functions like manufacturing vitamins for plants, for example. But if we're using lots of chemicals, then we will still have some microbes, but we won't have enough to reach a quorum. So it's that tipping point that's really important. It's like your, your board, if one person or three people or even four people come to the meeting, it is not enough to make a decision. So with microbes, quorum sensing means that there will be enough of them to actually alter their genes or alter the genetic expression in their uh, plant host or their animal host. And this is where microbes are so incredibly powerful because not only can they switch their own genes on and off, but they can switch plant genes on and off, animal genes on and off, and human genes on and off. So some of the plant genes that they can switch on, for example, are genes for things like acquiring nutrients, um, for being frost tolerant, for being drought tolerant. And that's why where we see in soils where microbes are reaching a quorum, that plants become more drought tolerant, become more frost tolerant, have higher nutrient densities in them. People are thinking we're getting we can move that up. Let's see if this will help. So we're gonna see if this will help in the back. What do you think? Yeah, okay. All right. Fine. Mm -hmm. So you weren't able to hear me in the back? Some of it. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I assumed that you could hear me and I didn't realise that you couldn't. Start over. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so just as a quick summary, <laughs> microbes are really important <laughs> and you have to have a lot of them and you have to have a lot of different kinds of them because they are all capable of performing different tasks. So that's one reason why we have to have a lot of different kinds of plants growing in soil because every kind of plant will support a different um, microbiome, we call it, of like having microbes on it, in it and around it. 
And we need those microbes to uh, perform very, very important tasks in our soil, like conferring, like switching genes on in plants, for example, for drought tolerance, to frost tolerance, nutrient acquisition, uh, also for tolerance to pests and diseases, all sorts of things like that. It's just like we see the same parallels in human health as we see in soil health. This microphone is much better. It was a shame I didn't have this one to start with. So I'm sorry if, if you couldn't hear what I was saying. So, uh, so, okay, so in the microbial world, quorum sensing, it's density dependent, it's coordinated behaviour. Microbes are using these um, quorum sensing signals, so they're little um, chemical structures called autoinducers that are floating around. There's millions and millions of them floating around in the soil, um, microbes having a conversation with each other. So it occurs in all species of bacteria, archaea, fungi and viruses. All microbes use quorum sensing to communicate. So every species produces its own unique signal. So every species of microbe needs to know how many of them there are. Because um, if there's only a few, they're going to keep really quiet. They're not going to do anything else. They're not going to do anything that's going to attract attention because someone might come along and eat them. Um, and if there's lots and lots of them, obviously they're, they're going to be more powerful. I mean, we do the same thing to some extent. If I was up here speaking to a room full of uh, people manufacturing neonicotinoids, for example, they probably weren't going to be too impressed about me saying don't put that on the seed because it's going to affect the microbial populations around that seed. I may not necessarily uh, want to even get up and speak to those people. If I'm speaking to a room full of people that I know are important, interested in soil health, then I'm going to be you know, able to, to say what I really think about soil health. So microbes are the same. They're sensing the environment all the time. Is it safe um, or is it not? Should I keep quiet? Uh, so they use these auto-inducers, the signaling molecules. And when the concentration of those reaches a critical level, then <coughs> they're able to switch on their genes to do various things or switch on the genes of their hosts. And what do they look like? Well, <coughs> they're fairly complex biochemicals. I'm not going to go into any detail about this. If you want to Google auto-inducers, this one comes from core principles of bacterial auto-inducer systems. It basically talks about um, gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, etc., and what sorts of auto-inducers that they produce. Um, the thing about that you need to know about auto-inducers is that this is a bacterial cell producing auto-inducers. Every auto-inducer will have its own formula, that we, which we can represent as a shape, you know, it could be a, a square or a triangle or a circle or something, and that will fit into a, a receptor site in another bacteria of the same species. So that when there's a whole lot of these in the environment, um, that is how other bacteria know that there's a whole lot of them there. Um, and then it, will, then it can change its genetic experience. So this comes from an article called The Languages of Bacteria. Um, and this lady here, Bonnie Bassler, she produced a great little TED talk called How Bacteria Talk. Um, and if you want to know more about auto-inducers and how bacteria speak to each other, I'd recommend, I think it's 18 minutes, but the 18 minutes goes really quickly because it's a really, really good little talk. So how bacteria talk, Bonnie Basma. So this is very similar to how we actually communicate, like within our bodies, how we've got a whole lot of different organs, our heart, liver, lungs, spleen, kidneys, um, everything all actually functioning, hopefully in a coordinated way, to make us work as a unit. So you can't just, you know, take your heart out, your liver out, or your spleen out and put it on one side and say, well, that's just going to work all by itself. We have to have all those things in an integrated system, working together, and there's lots and lots of communication going on in your body all the time with all your different organs, sending out signals and speaking to each other, if you like, communicating with each other using biochemical signals that fit into receptor sites in exactly the same way as bacteria communicate. So just to give you an example of that, uh, for example, your pituitary uh, gland, which is located in your um, brain, could be sending out a signal telling your thyroid to get going and get active. That will be called a thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. Um, that hormone is released into your bloodstream. Your thyroid will have receptor sites for that and will respond to that, hopefully, but you know, your liver and your kidneys and your spleen and your heart and your lungs and all the other organs in your body are going to ignore thyroid stimulating hormone because it's not for them. 
it's a specific shape and it fits into a specific receptor site in your thyroid. So any of you who understand about you know hormones in the human body and biochemical signals in the human body, you'll, you'll know how that, how that works. It is exactly the same in the soil. There are lots and lots of living things in the soil sending out signals. Some things can respond to those, other things cannot respond to those. So it depends whether they have receptor sites for them or not. So microbes are also multilingual. Not only can they talk to each other, but they can, they can figure out how many others of other species and other kinds are there. So the bacteria will know how many fungi are there. For example, the fungi will know how many bacteria and so on because they're all very good at picking up all these different um, molecules. So they know how many of us there are and how many of them are, they are, there are. And I'm not going to go into it in any more detail than that other than to tell you that basically that is how soil works with microbes communicating with each other. So all plant and animal genes and human genes are influenced by quorum sensing. That is the important part, not necessarily the science of it, but the fact that, and you know that genes regulate for a whole lot of different things, genetic expression, like in animals, for example, um, your livestock, you know, genetics is important for how fast, uh, your feed conversion efficiency and those kinds of things. Um, heat tolerance, drought tolerance, cold tolerance um, are all going to be regulated genetically, as it is the same in plants. So it's very, very powerful that microbes are able to switch genes on and off in plants and animals. So if we, if we actually want to use this knowledge for our benefit, we have to figure out how to improve those conversations. And really, that's all we need to know. We don't need to know the biochemistry of it. We don't, we don't need to know the language. We just need to figure out how to uh, improve the conversation so that there's more of them and there's more good things happening in the soil. So when we're standing on soil, we're standing on the rooftop of another world and you're all very well aware of that. Um, but we have to think about that as a holobiome. We, we've in the past always wanted to look at things in detail. So we will look at one kind of plant in detail um, or we'll look at one specific part of the plant in detail instead of realising that the community is a holobiome, but the above parts and the below ground parts and then all the microbes that live on in and around those plants, that whole thing is important. So we can't go and spray some fungicide on some leaves or something without affecting everything. Or we can't plant a seed that's got poisons on the seed without affecting everything. We, we tend to look at those things in isolation without understanding the bigger effects. Because when we get that holobiome actually functioning as it should, as a coordinated unit, then everything changes. It becomes a super organism. Extraordinary things happen that we don't see happen otherwise. So the things that we have to consider, again, I've just said it's a holobiome, and now I'm gonna break it into parts, but the philosphere, which is everything that's above ground, the rhizosphere, which is what's around the plant roots, and then the endosphere, which is what is actually inside the plant. So a lot of soil health has actually talked about the rhizosphere, which is not really surprising because that's what's around plant roots and we've become very interested in plant roots and seeing how many are there, how deep are they, are they you know, do they have rhizosheaths or dreadlocks around them, you know, is there exudation happening around plant roots, how, how fast are they building soil? Um, the philosphere is something that's really been of more interest, I suppose, to people who study insects and look at how, uh, also look at how plants communicate with insects and plants communicate with each other above ground. The endosphere has probably um, been the last frontier, but in the last few years there's been a lot of work on what's actually going on inside plants um, and, and how are microbes working inside plants. So if we look at the, like the holobiome, I think I've got something here that's got a pointer on it. Yes, okay. So, oops, pressed all the wrong things then. Dangerous with technology. So we have to look at this whole thing. So the leaves and the stems and everything, this is the above ground part, the philosphere. So, you know, plants are actually going to be communicating with other plants above ground 
And then below ground, we've got all the things that happen around the rhizosphere, which most of you are very familiar with. We've got root exudation and we've got nutrients and chemical signaling. We've got beneficial microbes and we've got uh, pathogenic microbes and all the interactions that go on there around the rhizosphere. That's something that we do know quite a lot about. But the philosphere, if we were actually to look at that in terms of the chemicals that are there for, from a plant perspective, you think there's just a plant sitting there, or a crop sitting there, or a, um, a diverse mix plant sitting there? And this is what it looks like from the plant perspective. They're actually picking up on all these signals all of the time that are all around them that we can't see with the naked eye. And it's probably a little bit like in this room right now, there's radio signals and television signals and signals from people's phones and all kinds of things that if you have a device, if you have some kind of um, antenna or some kind of a receptor that can actually pick up those signals, you can tune, you could tune into the television or you could tune into the radio or you could call someone on your phone, right? But we can't see, the signals are all here in the room, but we can't see them. So the next time you're looking at your crop or your pasture, think that those plants are actually growing in an atmosphere that looks like that. They know, through all those signals, what's going on around them. And those signals can be changed by what kinds of microbes they have on their leaves. Um, we know, for example, that insects are picking up on these signals all the time. So if plants have a bricks level of less than 12, for example, they're going to be subject to insect attack. If they have a bricks level over 12, the insects will just keep going and go and pick on someone else's crop. So people, you know, entomologists are very aware of these, these plant signals and what they mean. Um, one example of this is that you'll see, for example, on this plant, that the older leaves, which have a lower bricks level than the younger leaves, are being attacked by insects because they're giving out a different signal. So we'll see these kinds of things if you observe them. So the rhizosphere, again, we know, we know a lot about that. Um, we've got the plant root over here, soil particles over here, and the rhizosphere is this incredible area of biological activity around surrounding that plant root. Here you see lots of hyphae of fungi. Some of those will be simians like uh, mycorrhiza and trichoderma. Some of them will just be saprotrophic fungi that are just feeding on these exudates, which you can see little droplets of plant root exudates coming out. What you can't see even on that photograph are the billions of bacteria and archaea that are too small to show up at that level of magnification. Of course, not all rhizospheres are like that. That's a very, very healthy one. And if we're using chemicals in agriculture, then uh, we're not going to see those healthy rhizospheres because we're going to knock those microbes out and that makes a huge difference to plant health. So just to give you one example of that and um, something we can talk about for hours, but we don't have the time, this plant on the left here, these are roots of oat plants that have been fertilised with nitrogen. And this is oat plants roots on the right that have not had any nitrogen fertiliser applied and you actually can't see the roots. They're in behind all of that, uh, those dreadlocks there. So it's a high magnification photo of riser sheaths on plant roots and all you can see are the hyphae of beneficial fungi, you can see all kinds of glues and gums that are sticking soil particles together, making the plant much more drought tolerant because it holds a lot more moisture around the roots, creating air spaces and creating spaces for water. This poor plant has got no microbes to help it to obtain any of the things that it needs. Certainly won't be fixing any nitrogen, there's lots of free living nitrogen fixing bacteria here fixing nitrogen for this plant. Um, so this one of the things that we inadvertently do in agriculture. We don't realise. So when I say chemicals, I don't just mean fungicides and insecticides. I mean, we've got to look at the effect of high analysis fertilisers on, on plant roots. And then the endosphere. Well, the endosphere is what happens inside the plant. Um, endo means in. So we have some well-known plant symbionts that live partly outside and inside plants, like mycorrhizal fungi um, and nitrogen-fixing bacteria that live in nodules on, on plant roots. 
So, you know, you'll, you'll see lots of examples and there are people in the room I know who actually do microscopic examination of their plant roots to look to see, you know, are there uh, arbor schools of mycorrhiza inside my plant roots? Uh, and again, that's a close up of an arbor school. So what we have here is if we just go back to this one again, we have cells within the plant root and we have hyphae and arbuscles of a fungus that lives partly outside in the soil and partly inside the plant roots. So we're aware of those kind of microbes that live inside plants, like in the endosphere. But there's been a lot more study in recent times of other things that live inside plants other than these well-known symbionts. And one of the things that's come to light in recent years is what's called the core microbiome. So this is a very, very specific assembly of microbes that are in the seed of a plant. And all the different species of plants will have a different assembly of a core microbiome. You know, so wheat will have a different assembly to barley, to triticale, to rye, to oats, or to sunflowers, or sorghum, or whatever it may be. Every kind of plant will have its own core microbiome. When that seed germinates, those microbes that are inside that seed come out into the soil and surround that seed and help it to establish. What happens if we put something on the seed? If we coat it with some kind of toxin, if we put fungicide on there, if we put insecticide on there, we actually prevent that from happening we make a difference to the core microbiome of that plant. It's a bit like um, in human example, we have a core microbiome as well, which we inherit from our mothers when we're born. But if you were to take a newborn baby and, and like dose it in antiseptic or something and fill it with antibiotics and completely eliminate all the microbes that were on and in that baby, you would have a dramatic effect on its health in the future. So we, we want newborn babies to inherit lots of microbes from their mothers. We want seeds that we plant in soil to have a healthy core microbiome. So think about that. It's very, very important um, because it, those microbes form a relationship with that newly germinating plant and then they help it. Um, they help it to grow. They enhance its nutrient acquisition, help it to get nutrients from the soil, um, and increases its tolerance to those. So biotic stresses are things like pests and diseases, and abiotic stresses are things like drought and frost. So we are actually affecting our plant's fitness by uh, if we influence that core microbiome. And that microbial assembly, that core microbiome, stays with plants for their entire life. So the microbes that are released into the soil around a germinating seed, they move back into the seed again as the plant grows, they develop inside the plant, and then when the plant forms seeds again, the core microbiome is there in the seed ready to, uh, for the next generation. So the other thing I wanted to talk about very briefly was biological induction, and that's where microbes that are in the soil um, move into plants the plant will invite them to move into them and so they move from a free living soil phase into a free living phase inside the plant. They will often remain with the plant for its entire life. And uh, again, they may even end up in the seed and be distributed again when the seeds are, are you know, so sometimes like, I mean, we harvest seeds of commercial crop plants, but in wild situations, Seeds are often distributed by birds or by small ground mammals, those kinds of things. This is how microbes move around in lots of cases. So why is that important? Well, some of the microbes that move into plants, just for example, are able to fix nitrogen. So they're free living in the soil. We have free living nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil that move into the plant. Once they're actually in the plant, they could be anywhere in the plant. They could be in the stems, they could be in the leaves they are able to fix nitrogen within that plant using the energy that the plant is generating from photosynthesis. Now, if you do a soil test, you could say, there's virtually no nitrogen in this soil. There isn't enough nitrogen in this soil for this plant to grow. But if you do a leaf test, 
you will actually find that the plant has spot on the right amount of nitrogen in the leaf. So you'd be going, so how can it have perfect amounts of nitrogen in the leaves, but the soil test is showing that there's virtually no nitrogen in the soil. In fact, that is how you want it to be. You want to have no, virtually no water-soluble nitrogen in the soil. You want your soil test to show, if possible, zero nitrate in the soil. You want your leaf test to show absolutely optimum levels of nitrogen, and that can happen. We do see examples of that happening. How is that happening? That's happening because of biological induction. It's happening because free living nitrogen fixing bacteria are moving from the soil into our plants. So a soil test tells you virtually nothing that's of, of any use, um, apart from a soil test that tells you how much carbon you have in your soil. That's about the only useful thing soil tests um, can tell you. So these microbes, these um, Induced microbes, they're significant for nitrogen fixing, they're important for plant protection. They also help the plant to fight off pests and diseases and, and therefore important for plant fitness. So these kinds of things are very, very significant for agriculture. But we've tried to replace that kind of biological activity that's been around for thousands of years uh, with high analysis fertilisers. We think, oh, we can put stuff on plants to make them grow. We'll just put some nitrogen on there or some phosphorus on there and get them to grow, when in actual fact they already have all these mechanisms for growth, that we're interfering all the time with those natural mechanisms. So how are we going to support the microbes? Again, it doesn't have to be complicated. As long as we understand that they're important, we don't have to know how they talk to each other or anything else other than the fact that we have to look after them and provide conditions to have lots of them um, rather than using high analysis fertilisers. So we, the key factors for having lots of microbes in your system are the key things that you've all been talking about for the last two days and for years, in fact. Year-long green. We want to have green for as much of the year as possible. Plant diversity is important. And we use going to use biostimulants in place of synthetic fertilisers. So just on that note of year-long green, uh, I notice that there's a lot of emphasis being put on uh, maybe letting something go through to maturity and then planting something else in it. And that's fine for, you know, maybe a, a cash crop that you need to harvest. Um, there's a lot of people now with their cover crops are looking at things like how they actually manage that cover crop because the carbon that gets into the soil is going to come from root exudates. There's very, very little carbon from above ground biomass that ever permanently remains in soil. So somewhere between um, root exudates count for something like five times up to 30 times more carbon in soil than uh, above ground biomass does. So there's kind of a bit of a, um, uh, a, misno um, a misunderstanding out there about well if we grow this many tonnes of biomass it's actually going to produce this, this increase in soil carbon. Lots of people have been surprised when that hasn't happened. Um, you can have plants that are only very small that are exuding massive amounts of carbon from their roots. In fact, it's when they are very small that they are. So a newly germinating plant and a plant in the young vegetative stage or the early vegetative stages, that is when it's exuding lots and lots of carbon. So we have Australian farmers that are trialling cover crops for the first time and trying to grow something in a very hot, dry summer that might only grow six inches or maybe 12 inches or so and you know, widely spaced plants and it might look like pretty ordinary. You know, the neighbour especially be going, what on earth are you doing? But those plants, small as they are, are making a huge, huge, huge impact on that soil. In fact, they're probably doing more for that soil than um, you know, a six foot high crop of something that's irrigated and fertilised that is producing a huge amount of biomass and not doing anything for the soil because it doesn't need to. So the hotter and the drier it is, or the more adverse the conditions are, the more exudates there will be. So we see the best riser sheaths and plants growing in uh, the most hostile soils. So if the soil's got, you know, if it's, if it's a sandier kind of soil, you'll see better riser sheaths. If it's hot and dry, you're gonna see better riser sheaths. And the plants that produce good riser sheaths will be the most drought tolerant. So if you wanted to select a drought tolerant cultivar or something, or, or variety of something, the easiest way to do it would actually just put them all in pots of sand, 
different cultivars. I mean, water them for a certain amount of time, turn the water off, um, and then the ones that are, have the best riser sheaths will actually be your most drought tolerant varieties. So we, we actually need to force plants, we need to make plants work. Um, we need to force them to produce, or manage them, I probably should say, we'll be a little kinder, we'll manage them to produce exudates. So if you let something turn from vegetative to reproductive, in other words, it starts to, um, to bolt up to, uh, to produce flowers or seeds, or initiate the production of, of flowers or seeds, it is going to switch off exudation. So one way that you can get lots of exudates from plant roots is to, at that stage, graze them uh, or mow them or do something to take them back to the vegetative stage again. So just bear that in mind. The exudates are going to be in that early vegetative stage and you can get a lot of benefit from, um, from young plants that if they're frost killed or drought killed or something, they'll still do a lot in the short amount of time that they're there. But we do want uh, we do want year-long green as well. And one way you can promote more green is actually to keep things in a vegetative state so they don't go through to maturity. So biostimulants, what are they? Well, there's hundreds of them, different kinds of ones, basically anything that supports the soil microbiome. Biostimulant just means stimulates biology. It's not a fertiliser. And it's actually most effective when rates of high analysis fertilisers are reduced or, if possible, eliminated. So plant diversity also stimulates and supports the soil microbiome. There's lots and lots of research on that. The more different kinds of plants you have, the more functional groups of microbes you have, the more quorum sensing you have, uh, and the more stimulated. Um, every, all the processes in soil are actually stimulated through microbial processes. So again, plant diversity is going to be more effective when rates of high analysis fertilisers are reduced. So if you're using a cover crop, for example, to build soil, you're going to be much better off not putting any fertiliser on that and it may not look so great, but it's going to be working a lot harder. Make those plants work and, it, and use your spade, your shovel, I think you call them in this part of the world. Get out there, dig holes, have a look at the roots, put some fertiliser on some of it and not fertiliser on the other bits and have a look for yourself. You all have to be your own research scientists and uh, check these things out. Uh, you, you can't dig too many holes. It's really important that you be looking at plants all of the time. Um, so just to give a little bit of a, just an insight into some of the research, there's a lot of research being done around the world now on plant diversity, especially in Europe. Uh, I've noticed uh, in the UK and, and other places in Europe, there's a huge amount of research now being undertaken into plant diversity, either for multi-species pastures or for cover crops. So this experiment is in uh, Jena in Germany. There's a river here, and I'm just going to mention that a little bit later about what happened when that river flooded over these plots. Uh, these uh, squares here are 20 metres by 20 metres, which I guess is like 20 yards by 20 yards. Some of them just have monocultures in them, and some of them have up to 60 different kinds of plants in them, and they've been running for uh, 15 years. So it's a 15-year diversity experiment. And uh, there's all kinds of information that's been collected from those plots. In this case, people are looking at the insects that are around above them. And someone mentioned um, just before me, I think today, sorry, I can't remember who it was, but the more insects you have, the more birds you're going to have. So, you know, birds are often a great indicator of how well the whole ecosystem is actually functioning. But they've also looked at plant biomass and they've looked at all the microbes in the soil, soil carbon, soil nitrogen, soil phosphorus. So the examined the role of biodiversity on a whole lot of different uh, ecosystem processes and soil health factors. And one of the things they found in this experiment was where they had in that 20 yard by 20 yard uh, area, if they just had one kind of plant growing in there or two different kinds of plants or four different kinds of plants or eight or 16 different kinds of plants and then they had no nitrogen or 100 pounds per acre of nitrogen or 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen. So they did a multifactorial experiment with all combinations of all of those factors. And what they found was that if they had eight or 16 different kinds of plants growing together, it produced more biomass with no nitrogen put on it than having one or two different kinds of plants growing together with 200 pounds per acre per year of nitrogen. So what have we done in conventional ag? 
we have one plant kind of plant usually and we put on heaps and heaps of nitrogen and we wonder why things aren't working so well. So when, if we have uh, lots of different kinds of plants, they actually work better with no nitrogen because nitrogen gets in the way of this uh, microbial communication. So high diversity produces greater plant yield. That's probably more important for those of you who have livestock, I guess. And that's what we're seeing now is that most of the research is actually in forage systems. Um, there's uh, experiments like um, Diverse Forage, I think, is actually the name of one of the experiments that's being undertaken by Reading University in, the, in, uh, in England. So what they found in, in the Yona experiment was that this is the number of plant species along the bottom from 1 to 16. It's all basically a straight line in terms of plant biomass. The more different kinds of plants you put together, the higher the uh, total biomass was. And they talk about, there's a little video that goes with their research. They talk about, you know, exudates and things, all the life that's happening around plant roots in the rhizosphere. And also the fact that you can build much deeper soil with a greater diversity of plants. So in this diagram here, there's just two different kinds of plants, a flowering plant and a, a grass plant. And they talk about the soil depth with just two different kinds of plants together. In this one, they've got eight different kinds or eight functional groups of plants and you could build much deeper soil. And that deeper soil turned out to be very beneficial um, in dry years and also in extremely wet years. I know you've just had a very wet year in this part of the world and in fact many parts of the United States have had a very wet year. Well this river here that I mentioned before, the Yenna River, flooded over all of those plots during this trial and the scientists thought they had lost their whole experiment. So they've gone to all the trouble to set the whole thing up and been collecting all this data and then it floods like this. And they expected that when those floodwaters cleared away, everything would be dead and that would be the end of it. But what they found was that their high diversity plots, if they had eight or more species in their plots, they were all perfectly fine. And even the things that died due to waterlogging in the lower diversity plots, like some of the shorter plants that were underwater for a really long time, um, you, could, you could understand that the, some of the taller ones are obviously going to make it through, but the shorter ones that died when they were just growing on their own, when they were growing with the taller plants, when all the water cleared away, they survived. So we see this very frequently in Australia the other way around in terms of heat tolerance. So we see in summertime, if we have a big diversity of plants, that we can put warm, um, cool season plants like, uh, like your brassicas and things like that. We can actually put them in with warm season plants like sunflowers and sorghum and millet and they will get through the heat of summer. Whereas if we just planted brassicas over summer, they would last you know, five minutes. They would not grow on their own, but they will grow in a, in a mix. And there's lots of reasons for that. Some of those are just physical, um, you know, shading effects and those sorts of things, but there's a lot of other things going on as well. So diverse systems are self-organising. Um, the microbes actually know what to do and so really we, all we need to do is to manage for above and below ground diversity and the details will take care of themselves. Now I know sometimes in cropping situations you're not going to be able to put eight or 16 different kinds of plants or maybe not even four different kinds of plants together but there will be a lot more diversity in the soil if uh, you obviously can have diverse covers before or after. Um, um, a lot of you, I'm not telling you anything new there, you already understand about the, the effects of that. Um, obviously diversity in crop rotations, all those sorts of things, but you'll also have a lot more diversity in the soil microbiome if you look very seriously at the chemicals that you're using because a lot of those chemicals are going to knock out um, very, very important microbes in the soil. So one of the things that there's been a lot of emphasis on in recent years has been soil carbon. And again, just to go back to this German experiment in Vienna, they found that if they had eight or 16 different kinds of plants growing together, they accumulated more than 20% carbon in those soils. And that's very, very important for a lot of reasons because as you all know, I'm sure carbon is a key determinant of soil structure and water holding capacity and um, really helps with nutrient acquisition of plants. So if we look at that carbon molecule, 
just to give you a bit of an idea. I don't want to get too sciencey about this, but there are some important things. One is that if we form humic polymers, or if the microbes form humic polymers, they're going to have ring structures in them which are very stable. So here we have six carbon atoms joined together in a hexagon. Um, it, uh, it's called an aromatic structure or a ring. So when carbon atoms join together like that, it's very hard for them to be broken down by other microbes. Um, so they're going to be much more stable in the soil. They're not going to be broken down easily by oxygen and they're not going to be easily decomposed by other microbes. We, but when we actually look at this structure of a humic molecule, we, we then have to wonder, well, how did all those things actually get joined together? Because there's carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and hydrogen in there. All those different atoms, which didn't just, if you just put them all together in a, in a vial and shook them up, you know, they're not going to magically form this extraordinary polymer. So microbes have manufactured this. This is microbial, um, it's a microbial process. The microbes had to have a coordinated approach to making this. The humic molecule is manufactured by a combination of a whole lot of different kinds of bacteria and fungi, all working together to produce humus. It's really quite extraordinary. When I talked about quorum sensing and about coordinated behaviour and about some of the absolutely awesome things that microbes do in soil, one of those is to produce humus. Because humus is the holy grail for soil. It's got a high cation exchange capacity. Um, it's going to have, uh, it's a colloid, it's going to help with water retention in the soil and soil structure and, um, and nutrient status of plants. So one of the things that's part of that molecule, so about 60% of it is carbon. Most of that comes from root exudates. The other thing we see is that there's nitrogen in here, these little blue molecules here of nitrogen. That nitrogen has to be fixed by the microbes in the soil and it's going to be fixed and incorporated into that molecule at the same time as they're fixing it. If we add nitrogen from the outside, if we add inorganic nitrogen, like urea or nitrate or something like that, uh, or anhydrous, it is going to stimulate a whole lot of different kinds of microbes in the soil that are then going to need carbon and they're going to get their carbon by uh, basically breaking down these humic polymers and pinching the carbon from here because some of, not all of it is in the form of rings. Some of it is what we call aliphatic carbon, like these blue ones that are just in chains like that, that microbes can easily break off. They're going to take that carbon, use it to, uh, to build their bodies and, and actually break down our, our um, stable carbon in the soil. So just be very well aware of that, that the, the nitrogen has to be fixed biologically in order for the carbon to be sequestered in a stable form. So we really want to encourage biological free living nitrogen um, fixing bacteria in our soil to fix biological nitrogen. And the other thing is that there are phosphorus solubilising bacteria in soil. Plants can't grow without nitrogen, plants can't grow without phosphorus. So of course they have mechanisms for communicating with microbes to get all of the nitrogen they need. They have mechanisms for communicating with microbes to get the phosphorus they need. Um, again a soil test for phosphorus is basically a waste of time because it's going to show at the most 3% of the phosphorus that you have in your soil. Somewhere between one and 3% of the phosphorus that's in your soil will show up on a soil test. So you have something like 30 to uh, 100 times more than what actually shows up on a test. So, the, but the microbes can obtain, phosphorus solubilizing microbes can obtain the phosphorus that your plants need. They of course need energy to do that. That energy is going to come from root exudates and also those microbes that are stimulated in that process to solubilise phosphorus are going to feed back said messages to nitrogen fixing bacteria and increase nitrogen fixing, which in turn is going to increase the rate at which stable carbon is formed in the soil because unless you have nitrogen fixing happening you won't get humus being formed. So all these things are connected. Um, again, the details probably you don't need to know but it is important to know that when you add anything like water-soluble phosphorus or water-soluble nitrogen to soil, you actually interfere with those natural processes that take place. So soil organic carbon is the one single measurable factor that actually tells us most about soil health. We can tell whether things are going 
uh, in a positive direction or in a negative direction by looking at well, is carbon increasing or is carbon decreasing. It's one thing um, that will really tell you a lot. Derek shows a fantastic photo yesterday. I really love that photo, Derek, of, um, of your farm, how it is now compared to some new land that you've just acquired uh, and how there's been such a big change in soil colour. So we all um, connect with that. You know, when, when we see that soil has become darker, we understand it's also got you know, better structure and better water holding capacity and that plants are going to grow better in it. You know, like we kind of know, uh, we know green is good for plants and we know dark is good for, for soil. So we, we make that link. We know that that is the one thing that can tell us the most about what's happening in our soils. But the sad news is that the organic carbon content of soil has declined around 50 to 80 per cent in most agricultural land around the world. Um, and 30 per cent of cropland has been abandoned even in the last 40 years. Um, this is like well after the Dust Bowl has been you know, abandoned due to soil decline, which is loss of carbon, and it continues to be abandoned at the rate of 25 million acres a year. So we have these massive, uh, massive soil degradation going on around the world, and you have to wonder, well, why is that happening? Why is that going on with all the knowledge that we have about soils these days? And the statistics actually show that 50% of the world's cropland is bare in any 12 month period. Of all the land that's cropped in the world, 50% of it is bare at any one particular time. So it may be bare because we cultivated it. And um, in many places we went to no-till, this is an Australian photograph, we went no-till in Australia starting back in the 70s and uh, we have not seen any improvement in soil carbon in our no-till fields compared to our cultivated fields. And that was the reason was that no-till was never ever linked in Australia, it is now, but it was never linked to cover crops or having anything green. So where's the photosynthesis? Yes, it's, yes, we're not disturbing the soil, but we're not building soil either. So we have, you know, our CSIRO, which is our national research organisation, over something like 20 or 30 years of research has not seen any improvement. In fact, these soils are still losing carbon. So disturbance wasn't the issue, the issue was uh, green, lack of green. And bare ground influences local, regional and global climate. If we have soils that look like this in our hot summers, um, or even soils that look like that, we, again, we haven't made any improvement. We still have bare ground that is going to radiate an incredible amount of heat. Um, and if we look at that diagrammatically, I love this diagram that came out of the Food and Agriculture Organisation a couple of years ago. But over here we have an original ecosystem as Europeans found Australia 200 years ago, uh, or, or the United States a little bit longer ago than that, but green, green ground cover, green other green plants, and healthy soil underneath that green cover. And then we lose, this is uh, NPP decrease, NPP is just net primary production. Um, in other words, you've lost ground cover. For whatever reason, did we overgraze it? Did we burn it? Did we cultivate it? Did we spray it? We've got all these ways that we can destroy ground cover and we've been really good at it, haven't we, over the last couple of hundred years of reducing ground cover. And we're gonna get soil degradation if we lose ground cover. You all know that. And then we're going to get soil organic carbon decrease. You can't have less green and not lose carbon. And then when we lose carbon, we lose moisture because that's, what's, that's what gives us our moisture holding capacity. And all this moisture, extra moisture, is evaporating and going up into the atmosphere. And it's increasing the temperature hugely. This is, to my mind anyway, is the chief cause of the climatic instability that we have at the moment. Because what happens is that when you heat something, it evaporates, right? You take a saucepan of water and put it on the stove and heat it up, it evaporates. So these soils get a lot hotter than these covered soils. And we now have huge amounts of water vapour up in the atmosphere that weren't there a couple of hundred years ago. So we have to look at that whole system in the same way we have to look at the holobiome when we're looking at plants and microbes and the soil. We have to look at plants, soils, microbiology, hydrology, global climate. None of those things can be considered in isolation. They're all connected. Um, 
And so if we look, well, what has changed since the Industrial Revolution? We have all this talk about oh, climate change since the Industrial Revolution. Well, what has really changed since the Industrial Revolution? We've simplified the landscape hugely. We've gone from prairies, for example, that had 500 to 700 different kinds of ground cover plants. Um, and some places where there was not just ground cover, but there was also trees and shrubs, there were 2,000 different kinds of plants. You have ranches here in the United States that have 2,000 different kinds of plants on them. And we go to one single thing, like corn or beans or whatever it may be, or wheat. So we've hugely simplified the landscape. We've reduced the amount of green, you're all aware of that. We've reduced the diversity of plants. We've reduced the diversity in the soil microbiome. And you think that doesn't have an effect on the climate? It's massive because soil structure is deteriorated. We want our soils to look like this, to have lots and lots of fungal hyphae and nice big spaces between the aggregates where you know water can penetrate and air can penetrate. And the reason we want to have air in there as well as water is because air is 78% nitrogen and our free living nitrogen fixing bacteria need to have that air for, for their nitrogen. But we've gone from soils that should look like that to soils that look like concrete, and you're all aware of that. So if we look at that graphically, here's our concrete over here where we have all the soil particles pushed down together with no air spaces and no water between them really, basically, instead of this lovely, um, well-aggregated soil over here. So with this big change in soil structure, it has implications well and truly beyond the farm, farm gate, well and truly beyond the farm fence. It has, actually has implications for global climate because poor structure leads to poor infiltration. You are very well aware of that. We also have higher levels of evaporation and we have lower levels of soil moisture. Obviously all of those things are linked and um, I love the rainfall simulators that you have here in the United States. So Ricky was saying yesterday, did Bud actually develop these or he just has his own version of this? He manufactures, he manufactures them. So he wasn't the original um, design of them. Anyway, these are fantastic things. We, we now have some in Australia, thanks to Bud Davis. Um, and I'm sure all of you in this room have seen a rainfall simulator. Um, it's just like such an <laughs> eye-opening um, way of showing you know, green ground cover, we have no runoff here and clean runoff, uh, clear, clean infiltration, sorry, underneath it. So we, we're not losing anything from the environment. We've got great infiltration right through to our heavily cultivated bare soils, which have got no infiltration and lots of runoff with sediment and nutrients and everything. And uh, I mean, it, it has been mentioned over the last two days and you don't have to be, it's not rocket science to realise that when we're in this situation over here, we're going to have a lot more floods. I mean, really, it's not. Uh, so bare ground contributes to local and regional flooding. And, you know, the United States is not the only country to experience that. Uh, it also creates a heat dome effect. And I'm sure you're all aware, and I know that at many of the conferences, people talk about this. Uh, Jonathan Cobb just provided some data to me when I was here in summertime this year on their, their farm in Rogers in Texas. The ambient temperature was 105. Um, the soil surface in a bare field was 155. And then under a multi-species cover was 77. So if we have bare ground and lots of bare ground, and remember the statistics show that 50% of farmland around the world is bare at any particular time, it's going to increase global temperatures, isn't it? If you have all that hot air. So if you have air that's, if the ambient temperatures, let's just say the ambient temperature was 100, it's going to happen in many parts of uh, the southern parts of the United States in summer. So we have bare soil and it heats up to let's just say 120 and it rises because heat rises and then other air that's 100 degrees is going to come in hit that bare ground heat up to 120 and rise and then more air that's 100 degrees is going to come in hit that bare ground heat up to 120 and rise. I mean you're actually heating up, you're heating up the air making it hotter, creating a heat dome when you have bare soil. It has, it has to have a massive effect on your local climate. And the evidence is now showing it also affects regional and global climate because there is so much bare ground on agricultural soils around the world. So bare ground results in increased evaporation. 
Um, this is an Australian photo. We've got covered ground on the left, bare ground on the right. We've got water sitting there because it can't infiltrate. And it's either going to run off and cause a flood or on a flat ground like a lot of our country in Australia is like dead flat. It's going to evaporate. It's just going to sit there and evaporate. And we now know that water vapour is actually the greenhouse gas that has increased to the greatest extent since the Industrial Revolution. In fact, water vapour accounts for 95% of the greenhouse effect and there's lots of science around that. So this is water vapour here, these are the greenhouse gases. We've got carbon dioxide, methane, I think you call it methane, whoops what happened there? <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, just jumped through about 10 slides. Um, right, water vapour, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide and then other miscellaneous greenhouse gases. So it outshadows all of the other greenhouse gases by a massive amount, and that's the science. It has a far greater influence on local, regional and global climate than carbon dioxide. Can someone tell me what percentage of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide? Like how much of the air that's in this room, it's probably a little bit higher at the moment because we're all sitting in here. <laughs> Um, but normally, if we were outside, what percentage of the air would be carbon dioxide? Uh, someone said 75 percent. Six percent. Three tenths of one percent. Four hundred parts per million. So, four hundred parts per million. What does that work out as a percentage? Yeah, lots of zeros, right? <laughs> We're not quite that many. Point oh four. Point oh four percent of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. You really think that that is changing global climate? Really? There is absolutely no science behind that at all to show. Like, yes, it is a greenhouse gas, and so is nitrous oxide, and so is methane, and so is water vapor. They are all have. Those molecules all have the potential um, for what we call radiative forcing, but when it's 0.04% of the atmosphere, it contributes very, very little to global uh, climate. So this is the guy, this is the elephant in the room, water vapour. How come there's more water vapour? Well, there's more evaporation. Why is there more evaporation? Because there's less infiltration. Why is there less infiltration? Because there's lots more bare ground. And We've actually got a broken water cycle and you're going to hear a lot about this. There are a lot of people already talking about the broken water cycle and that is the big uh, thing that's having an impact on our climate. Why do we have a broken water cycle? Well, because we have got a broken carbon cycle. We've got a broken carbon cycle because we've got a lack of green plants. So there is something that we can all do. Everybody can do and we need people in the cities, you know, the urban population and the policy makers and but, you know, people that make decisions actually to get their heads around this and figure out that this is not going to be such a big deal. We can change things and if we have more green plants it's going to be better for everybody. It's going to be better for you on the farm because there's, uh, your soils are going to improve or if you've got livestock it's going to be more stuff for them to eat or if, you know, whatever you're doing on the farm is going to be easier because your soils are going to be easier to to manage and more productive and less inputs required, etc., 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 and it's going to be better for local, regional, and global climate as well. So, by changing land management practices, we can uh, significantly improve climatic stability, and we can increase resilience to climatic extremes because we know that you know the weather is always unpredictable and very variable, and it has been for a long time. We also know that the climate changes. It has never ever stayed the same, so we can't really expect it to continue um, being the same as it has been for the last several hundred years. It's going to change in one direction or another, but we can influence to a large extent how much that's changing and we can influence the stability of it to a large extent. But we need a quorum of people to realise those connections and those interconnections if we're going to, um, to join the dots, basically. So in the same way that microbes communicate with each other through quorum sensing, by producing these signalling molecules, which are called autoinducers, which then other microbes can detect and respond to, what we actually need in the human population, if we really want to do 
something about not only climate change but also the health of our food production system and the health of people is to start thinking about the real science and the real facts behind all of these things and joining those dots. And then once we reach, you know, a tipping point, a critical threshold, whatever you want to call it, or a quorum of humans that understand how these things work, then hopefully we might get some sensible outcomes out of it and some real change in, in the climate. So thank you very much for listening to me. And I know that some of it was maybe a little bit heavy in terms of um, the biochemistry of it. Um, but we're going to have a, a question and answer session um, with Derek and Tom later um, after a break. So there'll be lots of opportunity um, to discuss whatever aspects of those things that you'd like to talk about then.